The following program is sponsored by the goodwill, prayers, and financial resources of the Heritage Partners. Miracles radicalize us. Miracles make us to be focused on God. To be a Christian is to be called to be a miracle worker. Think of the sufferings of Christ and be thankful. And he did all that just for you and me not to burn in hell. glory this precious morning we are so delighted to be in the house of the lord we want to welcome everyone watching by television listening by radio uh, watching by live streaming facebook and youtube you are all welcome this is the international christian assembly we want to welcome each and every one of you in the auditorium here you are so very welcome i would want to ask you to stand if you can uh, please uh, stand if you can um would you just wave at your neighbor and tell them welcome in the house of the Lord? Yes, tell them neighbor, you are welcome. Amen, amen. It's a joy this morning to stand before you and bring God's word. So we are going to go to the Lord and uh, see what he has for us. We are reading from uh, Joshua chapter number 24. Joshua chapter number 24, uh, we'll start from verse 14. Joshua chapter number 24 from verse 14. We are ministering uh, on a subject we've called Enduring Household of Impact. Enduring Household of Impact. Actually, we are beginning a new series. We have called Responsible Households. Responsible Households. So that's a new series we are doing. Uh, hopefully we will have about four messages uh, as the Lord gives us grace. Uh, and we use Joshua chapter number 24 verse 14 to verse number um, uh, 28. If you've got the word, if you've got the scriptures, let us read together. Hear the word of the Lord. Now therefore... Fear the Lord and save him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers up from the hand of Egypt out of the house of slavery who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord for he is our God. Very powerful response there. But Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, no, but we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the the Lord to serve him. And he said, and they said, we are witnesses. He said, then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, the Lord our God, we will serve and his voice we will obey. 
So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and put in place statutes and rules for them at Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and he took a large stone and set it up there under the terebith that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness against us. For it has heard all the words of the Lord that he spoke to us. Therefore it shall be a witness against you, lest you deal falsely with your God. So Joshua sent the people away, every man to his inheritance. Let me read also uh, Romans chapter 14 verse 7. Romans chapter 14 verse 7, 8 and 9. It says, for none of us lives to himself. None of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Our Father, we are so thankful this precious morning. Thank you for your goodness and grace. Thank you, God, for the reading of your word. The word that brings life. We honor you for it. Now, Father, we ask, like we've always asked before, may the meditations of my heart, the words of my mouth be acceptable before you, my Lord and my Redeemer. May they bring meaning and transformation in the lives of every hearer. May you break this word, O oh Father. Let it go to everyone, O oh God, to their very need. Let it touch them. We thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' name. As every saint say, Amen. Thank you. May take your seats in the presence of the Lord. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Romans 14 verse 7 says, For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. Today, we begin this series on responsible households, and we want to talk about this aspect of households that endure, households that have great impact in that society, households that have got grace to bring influence and serve humanity with the grace of God. That's what we want to deal with in today's message. My recurring thought is that uh, the quality of household you influence to create has impact beyond your wildest imagination. The quality of household you influence to create has impact beyond your wild imagination. If you create a bad household, it has ramifications beyond your wildest imagination. If you create a positive household, you do not know how that household is going to impact in our generations for God. So it is important for us to consciously create that household positively. If we come to understand that there are ramifications to what we do in a household, then we need also to realize that it, you know, uh, it behooves on us that we must do it right. That we must create the household we belong to to become you know, habitations of God's goodness and God's grace. That we must be people that are with effort deliberately wanting to do the right things in the households where God has brought us. A family is the smallest unit of people, people related together that has kept the stability of society, small and larger society, as stable. Human societies made them stable from time immemorial. Stable in our social, economical ecosystems. Whatever system we may talk about, the family or the household, as I would define it, has 
been the stability to all societies. The household, the smallest unit. However, the philosophical and practical understanding of the family unit continues to morph. The way people would define a family unit a hundred years ago or 200 years ago is totally different now with how people uh, define what a family unit. Basically, a family has two or more members who live in the same home and are related by birth, by marriage, or by adoption, or in a way by fostering. That is a family in a really very simple definition or description of a family. It is people who live together in the same habitation who are related either by, faith, by birth, uh, by marriage, by adoption, uh, by fostering the people that are under them. While a household, here, here's a definition that is critical, while a household is where you have one or more persons living in the same house, such people may, may be related or may not be related. One person living in one place is also defined as a household. While a family is a unit of two or more, you can't call a family when you're alone. But you can call a household even if when you are alone. You are a household. So I am trying to amplify this and reach out to household instead of necessarily family. So family will be a subset of the household. Neither did we want just to deal with the family and then we forget about people that live alone or by themselves. And yet there are also uh, units, people who are many, that are not related, but they live under the same habitation. They are a household. They may not be essentially like a family, but they are a household. So we want to deal with that aspect. And if you see, when Joshua picks up this, he, does, he did not say, my family and I will serve the Lord. He says, my house. I and my house, as for me and my house, to serve the Lord. Some of you who have been reading uh, the Bible Challenge at the International Christian Assembly, you should have read uh, how, you know, Abraham, you know, with people 318 from his household. Imagine a household of 314, 318. 318 people from his household who went after the people that had attacked Lot and taken him as a slave. 318. Those are not his children. Those are not his niece, niece, nephews or nieces. These are people that live under his habitation. He is in charge of them and they are all regarded as a household. But that still, having said that, we need to understand that um, the family unit, as it was 200 years ago, continued to morph. And as it morphs, there are a lot of implications. There are a lot of implications as it morphs. Why? Because the way people define who belongs to a family, who belongs to a household, or the people uh, define who is a father, who is a mother, or how the people define what is gender, uh, you know, that gender is no longer, you know, a gift of biology, but gender is, you know, a, a result of social construct. Changes everything about, you know, the family and the household as we know it. It is important for us to understand as we, we work through this, we need to understand and have that concept of what God desired to see in our lives. And as I minister this morning, I would want also to emphasize what I'm calling a household mentality. A household mentality is a collective mindset. A collective mindset which demands that each member 
of the household is always conscious of others in everything they do. That's a household mentality. A mentality in which a son, in whatever they do, they are conscious of how it impacts the rest of the people in the family. When the father makes a decision, he is conscious of the impact and the influence of what to do to the wife, to the spouse, or to the children that are part of the household. That is a household mentality. A consciousness that what I do has ripple effect into their affairs and into the lives of the people that belongs to that household. But I want also just to, to submit to you, friends, that the future is more complicated than the past when it comes to the issues of the family and the household. The future is more complicated. How you define that which is being reconstructed by sociologists and psychologists and uh, you know, some people that uh, have no uh, qualms about what the Bible says complicates everything. Complicates everything. You know, our, our laws sometimes do not move as fast as the laws in the Northern Hemisphere. Where sometimes when we read what is happening in the Northern, Northern Hemisphere, we are even shocked. But I'm just uh, standing here to remind you that, uh, yes, we belong to, uh, to, uh, to, to Christ and we belong to the kingdom of, of, of God. But does not mean everything in this earth belongs to Christ especially the laws that people enact. They do not necessarily uh, render themselves as part of the kingdom of God. So changes will continue to come. Changes about our households, you know, operate. Changes about relationship in the household. Changes about spouses in the household shall continue to come, especially that we tend to have a lot of influence from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere, changes shall come. Changes shall come. It is almost like, you know, it's a firm prediction that that which begins in the northern hemisphere trickles down. It does, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, changes with the time and the, uh, the speed of how it trickles down to the southern hemisphere. That has been a reality of the past 200 years that the Northern Hemisphere's practices, lifestyles, continue to trickle and impact in the lifestyles and uh, you know, philosophies of the Southern Hemisphere. Until maybe if we say this is not correct, this is not right, we are not going to accept it, we are not going to follow it, then that's how only then you can be able to stem those issues that may not be godly. But in this text we've read, we find Joshua who is coming to the end of his responsibility as, you know, uh, the army commander has brought them into the promised land and he has helped to settle them into the promised land. He is up in his years. Joshua dies uh, when he's 110 years old. Now he comes and he calls all the leaders of, of, of Israel at a place called Shechem. And he commands and he demands that they make a covenant renewal with God. That's what they are doing here. And part of the, this renewal is to demand that they commit themselves to follow God. They commit themselves not to follow the idols that are in this land. And I want you to see the description in verse 14 and verse 15. There are two sets of idols that Joshua refers to. He says, choose ye therefore today. Whether you want to follow the idols, the gods, across the river. Before we entered into the promised land. Or you want to follow the gods here. The gods of the Amorites. So he gives them actually three choices. Either the gods across the river in the in the wilderness when we trekked here or the gods of the amorites that are here in the promised land but as for me and my household will serve the lord so he demands from them he says you have to make a commitment you have to choose choose to serve god 
In this regard, Joshua shows that if the society of Israel was to continue and endure in the new environment, each household was essential in bringing this stability. Because when he talks about this covenant renewal, he doesn't speak about it from the tribal perspective. He brings it to the household perspective. He doesn't emphasize that the tribe of Judah, you do this. The tribe of uh, you know, Issachar, you do this. You remember we did that you know, in chapter, about chapter number 9. When they came uh, at, uh, at Shechem again. When the tribes would respond on the uh, blessings on one side. On the curses on the other side. That he did by tribe. But here he confronts them on a household level. And he says, what are you going to do about this? Are you going to choose to follow the gods across the river? The gods in this land? What are you going to do? Or are you going to follow God himself? So he shows them that if society, if Israel would continue to stay stable in that new environment, then it needed to begin from the household. It needed to begin from the family. It needed to, be, to begin from what God saw as the smallest but, smallest but united unit that stabilizes society. That's what he, he is demanding. So every one of us, we come from households. And we are all part of households. Every one of us, we come from households. So as we speak, we are speaking to you. As we speak to you watching by television, we are speaking to you. Because you come out of a household and you belong to a household. Even if you are living by yourself, you are a household. You are a household. And Joshua declares, he says, but as for me and my house will serve the Lord. So the unit of life of any society is found in the strength of of its housemaids and other households. The unit or the strength of any society is found in the households. The unit of life of any society is found in the strength of its household. If the households are broken, the society is broken. So when the households are strong, they are faithful, they are innovative, the country is strong. When the households are strong, are faithful, are stable, the church is strong. When the households are strong, whatever households here, you could be a single-headed household, single mom headed household, single father-headed household, whatever household you belong to, when it is strong, faithful, innovative, then we have hope. The country shall be stable. The country shall be strong. But when there is brokenness in the household, there is brokenness in the, fam in the, in the country. When there is brokenness in the household, there is brokenness in the church. I want you to understand, friends, households also became the center of uh, the church, the early church. When you look into the church in the New Testament, they emphasize the household. They emphasize the church that met in the house. The church that met in the house. <clears throat> That's the emphasis you find in the New Testament. But I want to repeat this. History shows us that whenever we tinker, whenever we, you know, change the foundations and the philosophies uh, that builds uh, these uh, households, the results are disastrous. Whenever we tinker, whenever we, you know, we, <clears throat> we, we do it like, you know, with a screwdriver and we tinker with the uh, uh, screws and uh, we, we, we work on the family philosophy and family structure in a way that we think it's being progressive. The results are, are disastrous. And it's important for us to understand that the structure of the families 
must be stable. The structure of the house, household must be stable to render grace and stability in any society. But of the truth, structure of the families has changed radically in the last 50 years. It has changed. It has changed so drastically. And with that change, it changes the practices of the family. It changes the practices in the home. It changes the lifestyle in the household. So the change may be philosophical, but it ends up being practical. The change may be so sociological and psychological, but they, you know, it becomes practical. It impacts our life. It impacts how we do life in our households. It does. It does. So foundational, foundation to becoming an enduring household of impact is being clear of what type of household we want to create. If we are going to have an enduring household, an enduring family that has impact and influence in our society, in our church, in our movement, it begins with us having a mindset, having a vision, having a dream, having an idea <coughs> of what type of household do we want to create. It begins there. It begins with the picture of what type of household. So you are seated there as a mother, you are seated there as a father, or as a young man, a young woman, who is listening to my, to my statements here, and you're asking, how does that impact me? Well, your household will continue, you know, causing, you know, either downstream, downwards, if you have no desire to have the right type of house, household. There must be desire to have a positive, high quality household by yourself. Rarely, rarely do people become great without desiring it. Uh -huh. Abracata, abracata have become great. Rarely. Rarely do people become great without desiring it. There must be desire. Accidental greatness rarely happens. Accidental greatness rarely happens. The probability is once in a, in a million years. You have to desire it. You have to envision it. You have to have a little bit of things put together towards that path, towards that destiny, towards that uh, you know, uh, uh, idea of what you want to become as a person, of what you want to become as a household, of what you want to become as a family. There must be intentionality. There must be intentionality. So you can't just get onto a bus and say, wherever it, it goes, I'll go. No, it doesn't happen that way. Not for a family, not for a household. There must be intentionality. As for me and my house will serve the Lord. There must be intentionality. There must be. So leading members of a household, whoever the leading person of the household is, whether father or mother, it could be uh, you know, uh, uh, a single uh, mom-headed family, single father-headed family, whoever it is, it could be, you know, young people that are leading that household, whatever it is, the leading members of a household are the ones that carry the burden of what that household should look like. They are the ones that should start thinking, in 10 years from now, what shall we be? In 20 years from now, what shall we be? In 30 years from now, what will be uh, what are we going to leave for the next generation? That is intentionality. That is intentionality. Two things I would want to emphasize this morning. Two essential elements that help create an enduring household of impact. Two, from this text, there are many elements that would give, but I would want to do justice to this text dwell only in this text. So I'm picking two things that are projected in verse number 14 and verse number 15 of Joshua chapter number 24. 
But there are many others. And we hope in the next three weeks we can be able to uh, uh, pull out many elements essential of creating an enduring household of impact. A household that which Joshua says we can depend upon for them to settle in the promised land and bring meaning in this promised land. What household? What type of household? So in verse 14 and verse 15, he gives two uh, strong statements. Number one, making great choices create enduring households. Great choices create enduring house, uh, households. Households become great and influential by continually making great choices. Every one of us, our lives are made by choices. Our lives are like, you know, hinges. The way we make decisions are like hinges on the door. Every day we make decisions, we make choices. And those choices, if they are significant choices that deal with our lives, that deal with our future, that deal with our children, that deal with our estate, those choices are critical in creating our household. So households are created by great choices. Great households are created by great choices. Unfortunately, many households fall in the trap of being at the mess of social and cultural forces. Where they are bombarded by forces, you know, from outsiders, yet they do not make their own choices. They are persuaded and forced to make choices, not of their own, but because somebody demanded that they should make the choices. And because of that, households do not become strong. Today, like I've already said, postmodern philosophers whose practices include the ideas that gender is not a result of biology, but social experience are already impacting our households. America is, 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 is you know, in, on fire when it's, they talk about uh, transgenderism. It is on fire because social uh, scientists, uh, progressive social scientists have been saying gender is nothing to do with biology. Gender is a social construct. So over the last... 10 years or so, there have been people that have been shifting, that have been shifting from being what they are biologically to what they feel, you know, mentally or psychologically. So you have people that will say, I am biologically a male, but inside me I feel I am a female. <clears throat> so I want the female to come out. So they start now shifting. The biggest challenge in, in America has been that the family, the heads and the leaders of the family have been, not been allowed to participate in the decisions the adolescents make when they come at that stage. At the stage where they say, I am a male biologically, but I am female uh, psychologically. Their parents have been removed from the equation. So a child can go at school and they can help that child, you know, take her to, you know, uh, medical uh, facilities where she's, she or is given uh, uh, hormone, um, hormonal drugs for her to start shifting. But many in the last 10 years even shifted practically where their uh, uh, sex, uh, sex uh, organs change. It has happened. But again, in the last two years, there have been a change. A lot of those who went this way are saying, this has never helped us, and they are shifting back. And it is creating a lot of unrest, a lot of psychological problems. A lot of the people that have been committing suicide are in those situations. It is big. It is big. And these forces are coming from outside. I am saying soon, if not later, these influences of the Northern Hemisphere, they'll come here. 
They'll come here. I'm not prophesying, I'm just telling the reality. But if I was a prophet, I would have just said, I prophesy. 20 years from now, there will be huge things. But it's just a reality. That's the nature of how, you know, uh, our communication with the Northern Hemisphere has happened. A lot of things that have happened in the Northern Hemisphere tend to impact the Southern Hemisphere. Through all our media, you know, uh, avenues of uh, social media, internet, uh, movies, uh, all of these. Globalization has been part of that challenge and vehicle to bring all these ideas to the southern hemisphere. And we, before you know it, it will be at the table, your dining table, you'll be talking with your daughter and with your son about these things. Already we've had people in our, fam in our, in our church here who've been confronted where their children and their sons are thinking this is the, the way I'm going. So don't ever think it's far. It has already impacted our society. It has impacted our church. These are realities. But enduring households intentionally choose what they want and are not at the, you know, at the mercy of uh, outside forces. They are not working. They create their own path. So one of the earliest choice, earliest choices the leaders of a household have to make is when they are confronted either to follow God or not to follow God. So this happens right at the very beginning. Before you are married, you need to have this confrontation with yourself. Will I, will I follow God or not follow God? So he says, either follow the gods across the river or the gods here, but as for me and my family, we shall follow God. So the best way and the easiest way, the earliest choices we are confronted, even before we are married, is will I follow God or not? And that's the best foundation. If you get married as Christians, you have already started on the right foundation. If you are not Christians, you have a big decision to make. Will you follow God? Will you follow Yahweh or will you follow your own desires? Will you follow God or will you follow your own gods? The call to choose is important. Great households are made by great choices. And you can't continue procrastinate big decisions. You have to confront you have to confront those big decisions. Being neutral is not accepted. Being neutral is not acceptable. You have to make choices. You have to decide. So making a choice about which God you follow is important. So every household has a God. <laughs> every household has a God. Whether it's a God with a big G or a God with a small G, every household has a God. Which God would you want to follow? And this issue of making choices is critical. In the Bible, constantly, the children of Israel would raise this. Elijah raised it at Mount Carmel when he told you know, the children of Israel that had continued to follow Baal or the God, a God called Baal, an idol God called Baal. He says, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? That is a very strong statement. How long will you continue limping between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. Choose. But you can't stand in between. You can't continue procrastinating. So fathers, mothers, you can't continue procrastinating over issues that are critical. If it is an issue to do with your faith, don't procrastinate. If it's a demonstration of integrity, don't procrastinate. 
If it is, you know, a demonstration that you are not a corrupt person, don't procrastinate. Don't let the people, you know, don't fail to make a decision about who you are. Can he do it? Would he do it? Would he accept? Please be very clear with them. Corruption doesn't come to my table. It is an issue we make a choice. Jesus Christ confronted, you know, the, 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 the followers. He spoke a very powerful message in chapter number 6 of John. Where he says, unless you drink my blood and you eat my, my, my meat, you are not, you know, fit to be my disciples. And people say, ah, ah, this is carnivorous. This is cannibals. We can't do this. And they started going back. And then Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, are you two going to leave me? Choice. Choice. But that one choice is not good enough. There are many choices we make. There are some choices that we may fumble over. Small choices. Small decisions. But the big decisions we should not fumble over. The big decisions whether, you know, to compromise your Christianity, we should not fumble over. The decisions whether to get that big, big, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> big contract and yet you sell your body. No, 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 no. You can't go that way. Great households are made by great choices. Are you going to follow God? Are you going to follow evil? Actually, when he says in verse 14, I want you to read with me verse 14. It's very strange, verse 14. He says, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. But put away the gods uh, that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, 15, I'm sorry, 15a. He says, and if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord. Okay, if it is burdensome in your eyes to serve the Lord. If it is mockery in your eyes to serve the Lord. If you think this is cheap to serve the Lord. If you think this is useless to serve the Lord. If you think it has taken you know, <clears throat> all your years and your years have been wasted to serve the Lord. If you have come to that decision... That serving the Lord hasn't paid anything in my life. If that's what you have considered. If you think there is no benefit to serve the Lord. If it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord. Has it been burdensome in your eyes to serve the Lord? Has it been useless in your eyes to serve the Lord? Have you lost? Have you lost? Because you served the Lord. Okay, you could be able to say uh, that promotion I was not given because I served the Lord. But is that truly a loss? Then that promotion was not good enough. If you think it is burdensome to serve the Lord. Okay, choose. Don't follow you. But I would want to encourage each and every one of us here. To have a joy serving the Lord. To have excitement serving the Lord. That's what he would want from us. Element number two. Enduring households of impact focus on serving God. The first one, they make the right choices. The second one. They serve the Lord. And that's a confrontation uh, Joshua is making to the children of Israel. Are you going to serve the Lord? And they retaliate three times. Yes, we want to serve the Lord. And Joshua says, I, uh -uh, I don't believe you. You guys, you will mess up. And God will come and he will you know, uh, punish you. No, 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 no. We will serve him. If you read, you know, it's almost like Joshua and uh, the children of Israel, they argue. They say, Joshua, why are you insisting we will not serve the Lord? We will serve him. <laughs> That's a discussion. No, 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 no. The way I know you, uh, you easily, you know, make mistakes. God is going to come after you with vengeance. Joshua, we have told you we will serve the Lord. Okay, bring a statue. We are going to sign a covenant. 
That's what happened. Because Joshua insisted. He pushed them to the age. I know you can't serve the Lord. I know you are careless. No, 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 no. We will serve the Lord. No, no, no. I know you people, you are so careless. The Lord will come and judge you. No, Joshua, we told you, we will serve the Lord. He says, okay, you are witnesses. Yes, we are witnesses. Then they write on the rock and they say, this rock has heard what we have said. <laughs> this is a covenant. This stone has heard what you have said. You have determined that you serve the Lord. I would want to use that to submit to you that enduring households are households that serve the Lord. Are households that are so determined to serve the Lord. <clears throat> so three, three st uh, uh, statements here. Number one, <clears throat> you choose to serve the Lord. You choose to serve the Lord. devotionally you choose to serve the lord devotionally you choose to serve the lord why what do i mean devotional this is saving him in all practical means spiritually saving him with your tithes saving him with your prayer time saving him with you going uh, uh, to read the scriptures serve him because in here you hear the phrase Demonstrate the fear of the Lord. Demonstrate the fear of the Lord. A great household demonstrates the fear of the Lord. A household that endures, a household that has impact, demonstrates the fear of the Lord, which is a summation of what is true religion and the mark of spirituality. So strong households have increased knowledge over their relationship with God. Strong households. Enduring households. They pursue the worship of God. So a household that endures, a household that has impact, has got a flavor of spirituality in, under their habitation. So when you walk into a household of believers, you do not expect to find anything that will stumble other believers. You do not expect to find, you know, uh, 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 you know, drinks that are addictive because they destroy, you know, the lives of people. You do not find literature that will destroy the mind of people. The household of believers should have, you know, a flavor of spirituality. You enter into that household, it has a flavor of spirituality that exalts God. So choose to serve God devotionally. Choose to serve God devotionally. For parents that are raising children, young children, this is even very important. To demonstrate, to demonstrate that you believe in God and that you pursue God, choose to serve him devotionally. Demonstrate. Children actually catch these things much more than they are taught. They catch it. They catch when they see you doing it. When they see you praying through. They will remember. That's a lesson you have taught them. Yes, from time to time you may teach how to pray. But do it when you do it yourself. That's a household that serves God devotionally. Pursue him. In your spirituality. Pursue him. In your understanding of what God has for you. And you are laying a foundation. Not only for yourself. But you are laying a foundation for your children. And for your great grandchildren. And for the great great grandchildren. You are laying a foundation. You may not be there. 50 years from now. 60 years from now. 70 years from now. But what you are doing now. Is critical 70 years from now. Devotionally, it is important for us to understand. Sub point number two there. They serve him with very clear moral boundaries. Very clear moral boundaries. You find this in verse 24, rather in verse 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him 
in sincerity and in faithfulness. Moral boundaries. There are some things, there are some things that we do that have to clearly show our boundaries. Households without boundaries are a danger, are a ship without a rudder, are a plane without a rudder. A household without boundaries, boundaries of what to do and what not to do. Those are boundaries, moral boundaries, a household. Here, Joshua says, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity. Do it with moral sincerity and faithfulness. Do it. Do it right. Set it right. It is all right in the household to say, these things we don't do in this house. Uh uh. In this house, we do not smoke, Pepani. It is your house, it's not their house. You can make boundaries of what you want in your house. If your child says, I have the freedom, go tell them, go get your own house. It is important for us to set boundaries, moral boundaries in a household. Yes, some people may tell you, you are, you are fanatics over these things. It is okay. It is okay to be fanatics and save lives. Instead of being so casual and destroy lives. It is. It is important for us to recognize that. Sub point number three. They save God and they save humanity. They save God and they save humanity. Enduring households. They save God and they save humanity. And this is the main thing that comes true. Will you serve God? Will you serve God? Will you serve him? Will you work for him? Will you align your devotions to him? Will you align your dreams to him? Will you participate in his uh, projects? Will you serve him? Every household serves something or somebody. Every household serves something or somebody. Those that impact the world, they do so with a great sense of service to God. But demonstrated in the way they deal with human beings. And I would want to submit to you as believers, proclamation of the gospel, which involves investing through prayer, which involves investing our resources, is one significant aspect households do the work of God. So, I want to suggest to you, if you want to impact generations to come about the kingdom of God, demonstrate it today. Demonstrate that you are able to invest into the kingdom of God. Demonstrate that you pay your tithes. Demonstrate that you give your faith promises. Demonstrate to your children. Demonstrate to the people in your household. This is what makes sense. This is the direction of God. Demonstrate it today. And those households, they endure for a long time and they bring impact in the society. So friends, I want to submit to you, service to God is a noble activity. Amen? Do not despise service to God. Do not despise working for God. Whatever you do for God, service to God is a noble activity. It is a noble activity. You serve him. Why? Because he saved you. Amen? You serve him because he saved you. He delivered you. He changed your life. He gave you hope. He stemmed, you know, the bleeding in your life. And he gave you hope. That's why you serve him. But enduring households also have a generational mentality. Whatsoever they do is not only for them. I like the way Paul says. He says, not, not Paul, I'm sorry, Joshua. This is what Joshua says. Joshua says in verse 14, the last one. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua says, I have my commitment for me. 
But at the same time, from my house, Joshua is always thinking generational. He's thinking generational. So great households have a generational mentality. It's not just a household mindset, but they have a generational mindset. They're always thinking, what will our children, what will those who depend upon us become? They're always thinking that way. How will our children become? Are we going to transfer an inheritance to them? Are we going to leave a legacy for them? That's a great enduring household of impact. So he says, as for me and my house, we'll save the Lord. We'll save the Lord. So choose to save God freely today. Amen? He says, choose. That's the first one. Save the second one. Now I put them together. Choose to save God freely today. You know, friend, service that is not free, service that is not voluntary, is usually based on deceit and by and hypocrisy. Choose to serve God freely today. Amen. Why? God loves a chief servant. <laughs> Let's all stand. Let's all stand. Today we are going to make a commitment that my, I and my house will serve the Lord. Amen? I and my house. Even if your household is one, you will say, I will serve the Lord. I and my house will serve the Lord. That is a commitment we are going to make. Would you please lift up your hands? I want us to pray this prayer together. And then I would release you for you to pray and uh, just make a commitment to the Lord. Would you say, Lord... Help me to choose you and your demands. Lead me that I may continually choose the best for my household. With your grace, may you help me to make decisions that will impact the strength of the next generation in my household. Today I pray Help me to invest in your work. Help me to pray more. Help me to resource your work more. In Jesus' name. Now go ahead and pray in the name of the Lord. Father, we thank you. We bless you. We honor your regard for the commitment that we make this morning. Oh God, for the choice that we make to freely follow you, to freely, oh God, save you, oh God. The commitment that we make that we develop an enduring household of impact. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Thank you, oh God, for your goodness and your grace, your love and your care in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for your goodness and your grace. We honor you. We love you in Jesus' name. Now, Father, I pray, I declaring your goodness and your favor upon your children, that each and every household presented here today shall be strong in the name of Jesus. Each and every household today that has listened to this message, oh God, they shall grow strong in Jesus' name. I thank you for your goodness and your grace. May you bless their coming in, oh Father. May you bless their going out. May you bless, oh God, the people in their households. May you bless, oh God, the leaders of their households in the name of Jesus. Give them grace to do it with love and joy in Jesus' name. As every saint say, amen. amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. The preceding program was sponsored by the goodwill, prayers, and financial resources of the Heritage Partners.